Hey everybody, last week we started a new series, Live a Better Story, from the book of Nehemiah. And we're going to jump right in at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. But before we do, you know, how many have found that whatever worked before is not working now? I mean, the old way of doing school uh, is no longer exist. Uh, maybe where you used to work and how you get your work done is different now. Your routine is different. Your life is different uh, and all the things in your life are, frankly, either a mess right now, or maybe things are starting to come together for you. And so we're going to pick up on a story where things are a mess locally and nationally. The people in this story are desperately in need of a plan for how to move forward. Nehemiah is the central figure in our story. He's the cupbearer to the king. He is a Jew that's been living in exile. Uh, he ha his life that he once knew no longer exists. It changed a long time ago for him, but he's created and carved out a new life for himself in a nation and culture that is very foreign to him. He has moved from feeling out of place to finding a place. But there's no place like home. Isn't that true? And something's about to change in Nehemiah's life. And so we're going to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, uh, which would have been if Tracy and I would have had a third child, that we would have named him that. Um, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in, the pres in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins? and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy." And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat, the Horoni, and Tobiah, and the Omoni official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate toward Jackal Well and the Dung Gate. You can only imagine what that must have been like. Examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Verse 14, then I moved toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall, and finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat and the Horoni and Tobiah and the Omoni official and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? And I answered them by saying, the God of heaven 
will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you will have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Nehemiah was looking to restore the good of what once was. We have been trying to get our lives back, looking at our challenging situations, asking what is best for our families. Families' schedules have changed. Work schedules have changed. The church has not changed, but it is different. Things remain unclear for many. Why? Because what worked before may not work now. Businesses are trying to figure out how to stay in business. What worked before may not work now. Some businesses are even changing what they manufacture and new businesses are starting. The interest rates are at an all-time low and everyone is saying, hey, maybe I should uh, move or I should sell or I should refinance my home. Some are wondering, what is happening to the American dream? Do I feel like I'm living in exile, in lockdown, in a foreign country? Some people have high hopes that all of us could make a difference in overcoming racial injustice, and still others don't believe there is any. Like Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day, some of our cities are in ruin. They're on fire. They're being destroyed right before our eyes. There are downtown areas that lie in ruin in certain parts of America. Nationally, we have lost our way. We're trying to find our way forward. And in Nehemiah's day, his entire nation had been overthrown by a foreign enemy, and their city capital lie in complete ruin. What was once a great nation was now without hope. They were living in poverty because of the choices of a previous generation. You see, their sins had opened the door to their own ruin. And like Nehemiah and his people, we need a plan. It's time to plan like a boss. We need to plan like a boss for our families. We need to plan like a boss for the future of our lives so that we can live a better story. How many are ready for a better story? You know, years ago, I developed a, what a system that I called Triple A Leadership. It was a simple strategy that uh, has brought me great clarity and has helped me over the years in finding my way whenever I need to come up with a strategy or a plan in difficult seasons when things are kind of foggy. So in your notes, we're calling this triple A planning. How do I plan like a boss and get my life on track? How do I create a clear way forward in my life? And you'll see these principles of planning even in this story. Number one is this, assess. Assess, make time for the details. Take the time to stop and assess and get the facts. How many times do we get all stressed out uh, only later to discover that we just didn't have all of our facts straight? You think you owe this amount, but it's really this amount. Uh, you think the lease is up on such and such a date, but it's actually this date, and so you have way more time than you originally thought. Uh, you know, you, you think that it's going to cost you this much, but it's actually this much. We, we assume the worst because we haven't taken the time to know the details. A lot of worry can happen before you really know the facts or the details. So step one is to assess, find out the truth. When Nehemiah arrives here in Jerusalem, he takes a tour during the night through the city to assess the situation for himself. And he, if he had skipped over the assessment process, uh, it would have ruined his future plans. If you and I uh, skip over the assessment process, if we hurry our decision, if we, if we get emotional and we start to push things in a direction that maybe emotionally we want them to go, we start seeing everything a certain way because of our own emotions, and we don't properly stop and assess the situation, if we don't do that, we're planning to fail. Uh, our family loves the HGTV channel. I mean, isn't it a great channel? And uh, one of the uh, new shows this summer is called Vacation House Rules. And it's hosted by this real estate expert and contractor. And he shows how homeowners can unlock the vac their vacation property rental potential. And so in every episode, he gives you his rules that he follows. And rule number one is do your research. Do your research. 
You know, most of the vacation homes in this show aren't what you would think they would be. They're, they're properties that are, that are struggling. They're like Jerusalem. They're run down. They're in disrepair. And so he researches the rental values uh, that could be, and then he creates an actual plan that will change those owners' lives. Nehemiah wanted to see things for himself. When you're about to make a big decision, get the details because people tend to generalize They tend to exaggerate or leave out certain details when they want to push a major decision a certain way. I was leading a small group one time, and we were all sitting in this large uh, living room, and I whispered a story to the person next to me, and then they were to tell the exact story I whispered to them in the ear of the next person, and it was to go around the circle. So it went all the way around the circle until the last person heard the story. Then I asked them to slip out so they couldn't hear anything, and I read to everyone what the original story was. Then I had that person come back in the room, and I said, okay, tell us what you heard the story was. And everybody laughed because as the details were passed along, certain details were left out completely, certain details were dropped, certain details changed or overemphasized, and by the time it got to that person, it was a completely different story. The kinds of stories that we tell make an enormous difference in our lives in how we cope with our lives. For example, how are you describing living through COVID, the pandemic right now? What is the story that you're telling in your home, to your friends, to those that are around you, or to your own family? Will our youth, will our children, our youth, our young adults, are they going to come out of COVID thinking, we can overcome anything. That was really hard, but we can overcome anything. Or are our young people going to come out of COVID and they're going to go, man, that really set us back and we're victims and and man, we got a raw deal and now we'll always be behind. In July of 2018, 12 boys from a soccer team and their coach were trapped two and a half miles underneath the earth in a cave. Portions of that cave were now underwater, and many of the boys did not know how to swim. We watched on television. We watched their struggle. We watched the rescue team trying to figure out the best way to rescue these boys and the coach. And as time went on, people began to speculate and wonder, what kind of impact will this leave on these young kids? I watched a news interview with a psychologist that answered that question. He said the emotional health of these young people who are trapped will be determined by which story they choose after it's all over. They can either see themselves as helpless victims that were terrorized by this event in their lives, or they can think we can overcome anything. If we can go through that, we can overcome anything in life. The story you choose determines the life that you live. Joy is a choice. The narrative that you choose really matters. Nehemiah and the other leaders, they chose to overcome a ruined city by declaring together, let us start rebuilding. I cannot stress enough how important this is. The decisions that you're making for your family's finances, for your kids' education, your friendships, your relationships, every area of your life that matters to you, it starts with taking the time to assess the details. After Nehemiah assessed things, he brought the officials together. And in verse 17, he says, you see the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah gave an honest assessment. There are so many people that struggle with this, being honest in their assessment of what is true and what is real. The king had offered to provide resources. Imagine if Nehemiah had underestimated how bad things were. Uh, They would not have had enough timber, enough lumber, enough materials to rebuild their city. There's no room for downplaying the need when you're planning like a boss. It's all about being real. And in my experience, if you take the time to get accurate information, an accurate assessment, it can lead you down a good planning process, and you can make better decisions. But there are two more crucial steps to AAA planning. One is assess, 
look at the details. Two, adjust. Make power pivots. Adjust your thinking by challenging your own limiting beliefs. Stop thinking and saying, this will never happen, and find a way. You know, every successful company, nonprofit, and organization that's surviving right now is having to make real changes. They're making power pivots. And this is one of the most uh, positive things that God is doing in the reshaping of his church right now. He's reshaping the landscape of how we do things. In so, and in some cases, he's revealing the true strength and health of our churches and our own spiritual maturity. When Warren Buffett, the uh, famous investor, was asked about the pending or potential financial crisis, he gave this famous warning years ago. When times are good, everyone looks good. In other words, you can appear strong and healthier than you really are. But during a financial recession, it's like the tide of the ocean, it goes out and you can see who's skinny dipping. Let's be real. Some of us uh, weren't as healthy as we thought we were uh, prior to this pandemic. And it's revealed that. The stresses of the pandemic have revealed uh, the true conditions of marriages, of families, of maybe our own spiritual maturity and how we're handling this time and the words and things that we're saying and doing. If you invite God into your process and if you're willing to open up your mind to new ways of thinking and allow God to transform and renew your mind according to the scriptures, it will make you stronger and more loving during this time. Nehemiah calls it out in verse 17. He says, come, let us rebuild Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. What's happened here is disgraceful. Did you know during this time and season that some have disgraced themselves in the way that they've acted, in the way that they've behaved? Nehemiah was touching on a nerve so that we will no longer live in disgrace. He says, let's rebuild in unity together. We can do this together. And so he owned the pain and he took the responsibility and he said, you know what? Let's not live like this. What comes to your mind right now? What, what has gotten you down these days or these last weeks or months? What area do you feel some disgrace? I wish I wouldn't have said that. I wish I wouldn't have emailed that. I wish I wouldn't have done that. Maybe disgrace is too strong of a word. Maybe it's just that, that you're struggling. Many good people are. Before you can advance, you have to adjust. Adjust your expectations. Our series is called Live a Better Story. What do you see about your life story that you want to change? Let me tell you something that I've learned over many years. Problems need energy to live. If you keep feeding the problem, you're giving it power. It'll continue to control your life and take over your life. If you keep thinking and speaking limiting things over yourself, and over your family or over your church, you're gonna live out that story. The expression is true that life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You must plan like a boss. That means own the realities that you're facing and then adjust your thinking. Resources are never the problem. A lack of resourcefulness is always the problem. What will it take to get your child the education that they need? What will it take for you to get out of debt and stay that way? What, when, when will you begin to do the very thing that you want to do and know that you need to do? You have to be willing to assess and then actually make the necessary adjustments to live a better story. And lastly, number three is advance. Make a brave move. Have you ever uh, walked on fire, red hot coals of fire. I have. I've done fire walking. That's right. It's where you, uh, you walk barefoot over a bed of hot burning coals over a fire. Uh, I've walked 10 feet over red hot coals of fire in, it, it, that reached temperatures of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the same night that I did that, 24 people were burned and injured trying the same fire walk. If you ever want to make a lasting change, 
If you're ready to live a better story, like Nehemiah and his followers, to advance, you have to make a brave move, something like firewalking. Here's what you need to know about firewalking. By the way, if you want to plan like a boss, you have got to stop listening to people who have never actually done what they're telling you how to do. If you want to learn how to be a firewalker, listen to someone who's actually done it successfully. Here's how to firewalk. Make a decision. Fully commit. Block out all the pain and all the distractions. Focus your thinking. Be deliberate. And don't stop. <laughs> you cannot advance in your life in your pursuit of your own wholeness by dwelling on all the unwhole things that have happened in your past. Yes, you want to look at those things in your past. You want to be aware of their impact in your present, but then you've got to focus on your future. You cannot fix your child's education and their needs by accepting the broken story. You cannot rebuild your marriage or your career or your wealth by being indecisive by being uncommitted, or by living in the past. Once you've assessed your situation, you have to adjust your thinking. You have to become resourceful again and have faith again, and then advance intentionally. Nehemiah, after he mourned what was and lamented in chapter one, yeah, there's a time to do that in your life, but then he adjusted himself in chapter two, and he makes a big ass. Look at verse seven. If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. He asked the king for the resources that he needed to rebuild. He asked for the authority to travel safely. He gave God the credit. See how thorough his planning was. He anticipated the problems that were ahead and he saw the need and he was ready for them. To plan like a boss, you need to be spirit led and that's how you stay a few steps ahead. That's how you see what's coming and what to plan for. If you wanna live a better story, you must be willing to assess, adjust, and advance. But there's one more thing. You must value what God values. Nehemiah had favor because he figured out what God wanted to do, and then he did what God wanted to do. Many people have things they want to do, and then they ask God to bless what they want to do. Nehemiah first heard what God wanted to do, and then he aligned himself with God's purposes. God wanted to restore his people. God wanted to rebuild their city and their homes right where they live. God wanted to save them where they were. You know, God cares about the details of your life and what you're going through right now. You have stories that show how God cares about you. One morning, I was uh, reading these two verses. It was in Luke chapter 12. Verse six, it says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I wrote in my journal that day, I wrote at the top, God cares about the details of your life. Two days later, uh, after a very long day, I was studying on Sunday's talk, and then I went and filmed the talk, and then I got home about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and Tracy had ordered this elliptical that was out in the garage that in, a, in a huge box. It was a Soul Fitness E55 elliptical, and I went out in the garage to put it together. Now, putting together this particular elliptical was a daunting challenge. I mean, the sheer number of parts was absolutely overwhelming as we unpacked this box. I counted about 100 different pieces. There were flat washers, split washers, star washers, curve washers, switch wire caps, hex head bolts, Phillip head screws, 
rod end bearings, connecting arms, uh, upper resistant handlebars, all kinds of wires, sheet metal screws, uh, nylon nuts, nylock nuts, both of which drove me nuts. And there must have been 20 different other parts, uh, plastic parts and covers. And, and this will forever be the most massive detailed assembly project I have ever done in my life. The assembly schematics, it, it looked like the, the electrical schematics to the space shuttle. And you think I'm exaggerating. The assembly instructions came in a spiral wire bound 25 page syllabus. Can you imagine? Well, I'm five hours into the assembly of this thing. It's now 8 p.m. and I'm on part one of a four part assembly process. Tracy happens to come out in the garage. She says, hey, honey, would you like me to order in some pizza? I said, boy, that sounds great. While I'm connecting the console mass to the main frame, one of the flat washers fell out of my hand and it falls down this little small opening at the top of what was like a large flywheel. You've seen them on elliptical, the big round part and the skinny and it's very skinny. And at the very top of it, I accidentally dropped the, the washer. I get a flashlight and I'm barely able to peer all the way down and I see this little washer laying at the bottom, but the whole thing is enclosed so I can't get to it. And I'm thinking, I gotta get this out of here or it's gonna rattle every time that we use it. And I stopped and I thought of that scripture that God cares about the details of our lives. And I said, God, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what I need. I, I, I need some kind of like magnet or something that's 20 inches long that could reach from here to here to somehow get this washer out. And I thought, Lord, what do I do? And just then this, this old car pulls up into our driveway that I didn't even recognize. And it turned out to be the pizza delivery guy. And he walks up and he hands us our pizza. And I'm standing over this flywheel in this mainframe of this elliptical. And, and he says to me, uh, sorry, sir, the, the, the credit card number that your wife gave us, we didn't get the number right. We need to run it again. And so I said, hey, Isaac, would you mind to go get that? And as he goes in to get the card from Tracy, I'm standing there and the Holy Spirit prompts me and says, ask him for the magnet that you need to get your washer. Now, <laughs> now my natural mind thinks, why in the world would I ask the pizza delivery guy for a special magnet that I've never even seen in my life that can reach 20 inches down this little small opening all the way down to where this flat washer is at the bottom of an enclosed flywheel? But I've learned over the years how to hear the Holy Spirit. And so I explained to the pizza guy my situation. And before I could finish getting out all of the words, he says, do you need a magnet? And I said, yes. He turns around and he walks off. He goes back to his car. He opens the trunk of his car, walks back with a tool that I have never seen before in my life. It was a pin shape. And he hands this to me. This is a telescopic magnet. And guess what? It goes out 20 inches. And I was able to put this down that little small opening all the way down to the bottom of the flywheel and get the washer out. And I said, who are you to this pizza guy? What's your name? He said, well, I'm Ivan and I'm from Europe and I'm a jeweler and I deliver pizzas to make extra money for my family. And that's why I have the magnet. Now rewind that all in the back of your mind. God cares about all the details of your life. What are all the things that needed to happen to make that happen? Tracy had to suggest pizza to be delivered. I had to say, yes, that sounds good. And Isaac, yes, that sounds good. Tracy had to call the right pizza store where Ivan works. Ivan had to be on duty that night. Ivan had to be given our delivery, not to another driver. Ivan had to deliver the pizza at 845 while I'm actually still in the garage standing over this elliptical. The card number had to not go through. Then that moment, while Isaac's going to get the correct card number, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I had to be willing to obey. Ivan had a special magnet in his car that he had, I guess, I don't know if that day he put it in his car or that week he put it in his car. I don't know when he put it in there. That's 11 different things that I can think of, and maybe you can think of some more. Oh, there's... 
There's 12 that I can think of. You have to be listening right now to hear what God wants you to hear, and that is this. God cares about the details of your life. There's hope. There's hope for you. God will make a way. The breakthrough is coming. Nehemiah, on the day he stood before the city officials, he started by recounting to them how an ungodly king ends up paying for and giving all of the lumber that's needed to rebuild Jerusalem. What a miracle that was. And he told them this so that they would understand how much favor God had given to Nehemiah as the leader. Inside my garage is a, a small wooden paddle that says on it the words, Attitude Adjuster. <laughs> Sometimes we have to adjust ourselves before we can see what God is doing. God has been trying to teach Christians what the church truly is. There are many who still think that the church is a one-hour meeting in a building on Sunday. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is trapped inside a one-hour Sunday morning worship service. That Jesus did not die on the cross so that we could gather once a week in a building, sing five songs, preach and greet. The gospel is so much more than that. You see, the gospel is like a virus. It's a virus of love that's actually meant to be spread out. It's to go into all of our neighborhoods and into all of our communities and all the places where we live, work, and play. It's a, it's a healing virus of love that is to be sent out and to be shared to save everyone. That's our mission right now, church. It's not a matter of where we meet. It's where God is within us. He indwells us and he wants to speak through us and he wants to use us where we're at. He wants us to be the church in the world and in the community. God wants to restore us. God wants to rebuild us and rebuild our nation with love. And God wants to reveal his love to us in the details of our lives. And he wants us to learn how to be dependent upon him, even when we're in a lockdown or even when we're in negative circumstances. And that may require us to stop looking at all that's not right and adjust ourselves and start asking, what is God doing and how can I join him? I wanna pray with you and for you that God would speak to us in this moment and in this season. God, we want to see what you're doing, and we want to partner with you, God. We don't want to be a selfish people. We want to be a people that are willing to carry the message and love of the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we go. Father, we want to be carriers of your peace. We want to be reconcilers. We want to be a people of unity. And so, Father, open our eyes to see what you're doing in this season and use us by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.